Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and a uh, special welcome to uh, those of you who are watching uh, online and to the viewers on C-SPAN. Um, I'm Seth Cropsey, Senior Fellow here at Hudson. Uh, welcome to our conference on China's recent actions that aim to establish their own order in the Taiwan Strait. As you will hear in uh, greater detail from our panel this morning, China unilaterally changed the status quo of aviation routes in the Taiwan Strait in the first week of this year. The changes were made despite agreements between Taiwan and China that were reached in 2008 and 2009, and then again in 2015. These provided uh, for mutual consultation prior, prior, that is, to any change in aviation routes. This violation is part of a larger, broader pattern uh, of Chinese provocation in the region. For example, the Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning sailed through the Taiwan Strait one day after the aviation route change was announced. Since Taiwan President Tsai was inaugurated in the spring of 2016, to add to the list here, the Chinese tactical jets have circled Taiwan nearly once a month. This is consistent with China's policy that seeks to enjoy the benefits of an international world order for the purpose of replacing that world order with one of their own making. For example, uh, China signed and ratified the UN Law of the Sea Treaty <clears throat> during the administration of Ronald Reagan. The Law of the Sea Treaty established territorial and contiguous waters up to 24 miles from a state's border, a coast, and an exclusive economic zone up to 200 miles distant from a state's coast. China enjoys the benefit of a security that's provided by this agreement, as well as the distinction of ratifying a UN convention. But China's sovereign claims include the construction and arming of islands that are far beyond the UN agreement's definition of even the 200-mile limit of a state's exclusive economic zone, which does not come under any military classification whatsoever. China's selective participation in the international order is not restricted to military policy and actions, the World Trade Organization, for example, is an international organization that encourages free trade and provides a, a forum for resolution of trade disputes. China has been a member since 2001. Nevertheless, Beijing has controlled the exchange rate of its currency, maintains a large portion of the economy in state-owned enterprises, and preserves its controlling interest in setting the prices of labor, uh, of land, uh, credit, um, energy, uh, and housing, for example. In this case, uh, what we're here to discuss, <coughs> as, in, uh, as in all others, the international system is a rich vein to be mined in the service of a grand strategic ambition but never at the expense of China's Chinese Communist Party control. The same distinctive Chinese characteristics describe Beijing's violation of multiple agreements on civil aviation that had been reached with Taiwan. So long as the political stars aligned for China to benefit from mutual agreements with Taiwan, the agreements were observed. When it served Beijing's interest to, influ uh, to influence in its favor, 
the passage between the East and South China Seas, China decided to act unilaterally. Our panel this morning is important because it looks in detail at an egregious example of the Chinese state's consistent policy of shaping the international status quo to achieve its own ends. And this subject is important because it is a snapshot of China's broad policy. Abide by the rules so long as they suit you. A US politician once said to me that he would stick with us as long as he could. Um, he was joking, of course. China is not. With us this morning is a distinguished panel of experts. Their impressive qualifications are listed in detail in your program notes. Uh, in order of their presentations, Peter Wood will explain exactly what the PRC did early in January when it changed the aviation routes. Peter is editor-in-chief of the Jamestown Foundation's excellent China Brief. He will be followed by a retired senior naval officer, Vice Admiral Mark Fox, who, following uh, an exceptional career, in the Navy is now corporate vice president at Huntington Ingalls Industries. Mark will look at what the US Navy is doing in the region today and how the current administration's policy in the West Pacific is taking shape. Former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and Hudson Senior Fellow Doug Feith will conclude this morning's formal presentation with his observations on the strategic consequences of contemporary events in East Asia. Um, I'm going to move over to uh, my chair here, but uh, I'd like to ask you, um, during the question period that will follow the panelists' remarks, uh, to wait until you're recognized. Uh, receive the microphone. Um, please tell us your organization and your name, and especially to whom your question is directed. So thank you. Welcome. And uh, Peter, all yours. <clears throat> Thanks, Seth, and a special thank you to the Hudson Institute for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm definitely the most junior on this panel, so I'm looking forward to just adding a little bit here, kind of the, the broader context, uh, sort of what has happened, and also the political, um, perhaps, reason behind what this, um, why China has taken these actions. And then, of course, um, I'm hoping that my colleagues will be able to fill in uh, the, the the holes I'm going to be leaving, leaving of course. So um, Seth already sort of laid out the basics of this. In January, China made this unilateral action um, to declare this route, but there's a, um, the uh, M503. Um, but some of the things that need to be kind of taken into consideration are the fact that you know this, this is one of the most this is one of the busiest um, routes uh, in, in East Asia. You have lots of flights coming in and out of Taiwan. Also, flights going from Taiwan, uh, the proper island, to its sort of uh, outlying islands. Um, and then also back and forth throughout East Asia. So um, the unilateral action without consultation with the Taiwanese side um, represents a, frankly, sort of a, a, dan a very dangerous move just from a public safety perspective. Um, but to understand the reasons why Beijing has made these moves, we need to kind of look back at um, the last time there was a major negotiation on, this, on these routes. Um, there were initially uh, discussions between Taipei and uh, Beijing about this, about these routes. Um, but after the uh, after Dr. Tsai Ing-wen became president of Taiwan in May of 2016, um, those discussions uh, were canceled. So there was an option for greater Taiwanese uh, uh, PRC ROC um, discussion of these issues, but that um, but those avenues were essentially uh, shut down. Um, and so to kind of turn to the reasons of like why um, that is. I think we need to look to what's been going on in the PRC. Um, so in October, um, uh, Xi Jinping gave his 19th Party work report, um, had the 19th Party Congress, and there's been sort of a um, important turnover in key positions responsible for Taiwan work. And so rather than focusing on, for example, the specifics of you know the individual <clears throat> flights, I think what we need to kind of focus on here is 
what is prompting um, the PRC to take stronger actions, um, both on this issue specifically, but also more broadly, rolling back Taiwanese um, international representation and involvement in international issues, uh, international organizations, wherever possible. And, and again, an important uh, part of that context is this turnover on the political uh, on the political side for for Beijing. We have new um, people who are going to be responsible for um, both. Uh, Taiwan directed or leading, leading organizations at the central level. So the um, Taiwan Affairs Office, um, uh, another important office that's going to be in charge of Taiwan related work. Um, the United Front Work Department is going to have a new leadership. So there's essentially turnover in um, the, t the key leaders within the CCP that are responsible for taking it for policy towards Taiwan. And so perhaps that now that we've entered a new year, it should not um, surprise us that much that we see a, a, a more stern, firmer um, hand being taken um, with more aggressive action being taken to roll back uh, Taiwanese uh, relations with um, the Vatican um, and sort of a con continuation of the sort of rolling back. Um, and other, uh, and other actions to restrict and um, essentially take away um, Taiwanese agency, which is essentially what this represents. Um, another consideration is that uh, 2020 is not that far away. Um, Dr. Tsai's election uh, in 2016 was a major setback for the PRC in terms of its longer term goals for um, advancing its version of sovereignty, uh, version of, um, uh, of how it regards Taiwan. And so looking ahead to 2020, there, the, there's going to be a concerted effort by the PRC to um, take actions which economically impact people in Taiwan and force them to sort of question their government, um, both as sort of larger representative, representation in the international sphere and also more directly. I mean, flights are being canceled. Um, well, what does that mean? Should we, uh, that, that's, that's meant to prompt questions among the Taiwanese uh, citizenry about you know, who is actually in charge what will be the longer term um, best option for them uh, economically? Let's see. So, um, another consideration is that um, uh, the PRC has also been very aggressive in promoting itself as sort of being the, the future, of, like, of being the, the primary stakeholder when it comes to airspace in East Asia, um, both from an economic perspective. Um, it's a, uh, it's been very aggressive in expanding its civil, uh, civilian aviation. And so you have a lot of attraction from both inter, uh, 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 aviation manufacturing companies to sort of the, that are, they're invested in the future of growth of civil aviation in the PRC. And so this is, gives them additional leverage when it comes to rolling back Taiwanese um, agency in commercial flights and things like this. Another consideration is the fact that Liu Feng, the current Secretary General of ICAO, is a PRC citizen. And so from across these different levels, um, the PRC has a lot of different levers that it can pull to, um, to essentially to, to place pressure on Taiwan and roll, back its, um, and roll back its agency and sort of reduce the way in which that it can um, represent itself. Um, or push back against um, things like the unilateral uh, declaration of these um, of these air corridors. Um, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to my uh, to my other colleagues, who will be able to kind of provide additional thing, uh, additional commentary on sort of the strategic situation. But again, I think the I just want to emphasize here that it's really important to consider the domestic um, PRC political situation when understanding why there is these um, why these actions have been taken. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. And uh, Admiral Fox, I'd like to just make a note of it, since you may or may not have gotten this in your notes there, was uh, Deputy Commander of the Central Command under General Mattis and also Commander of the Navy's Fifth Fleet. So uh, with a distinguished career, not only in what he's done, but the positions that he's held. Um, <clears throat> Mark? Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context to begin with about the posture that the U.S. Navy uh, has maintained uh, in particular uh, in this region. The, the U.S. 7th Fleet has been an enduring presence uh, in the Western Pacific since the end of World War II. And we, in fact, have uh, a 
before deployed or permanently stationed, if you will, there are unique forces that actually are in Japan and they're in the region. So there's a, a differing construct in the Navy of when ships from the East Coast go to the Middle East, for example, it's a rotational kind of uh, construct. But also West Coast ships that will work up and go through the Pacific, sometimes operating in the Pacific under 7th Fleet, sometimes going to the Middle East. But the Middle East, I mean, rather, the, uh, the 7th Fleet is unique in that they have four deployed uh, permanently stationed, and the, va and the majority of the U.S. Navy is in the Pacific. So uh, despite the discussion about, you know, the rebalancing to Asia Pacific in the last administration, we never left. Uh, we were there in uh, meaningful uh, presence and in meaningful force uh, all along. And if you want to talk later about uh, any, any questions about that, I'll be happy to, to address them. The, um, the other piece I think that's important to remember is I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a historic context of some of the crises that have uh, been involved in terms of uh, PRC and Taiwan, in particular Taiwan Straits. Of course, uh, the first one that was of major significance was in the 50s, in the, in the mid-50s. And this was when Taiwan, Formosa, was still the Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek regime was still uh, very closely aligned with the uh, Eisenhower administration. And in fact, Eisenhower, uh, there was a great deal of tension that had come up in the mid-50s. Uh, the Seventh Fleet was there, deployed. Later in the 50s, the second Taiwan Strait uh, crisis occurred, and there was actual conflict. It was the first, as an aviator, uh, I, I, I've always studied this, but the first actual use of the Sidewinder missile in, in uh, September of 1958 in the kind of the second Taiwan uh, crisis, if you will. Now, in the meantime, this area is vital and key for economic growth for the entire uh, region and, and, I would argue, the entire world. During the Vietnam era, when we, the U.S., were involved in Vietnam, we actually had stations up. We had Yankee Station, which was up in the northern part uh, off of North Vietnam, and we had Dixie Station. And so we had continuous and very heavy operational presence during the, the 1960s into the 70s uh, as the, the Vietnam uh, conflict evolved. So the third Taiwan crisis occurred in 1996 in which PRC was actually launching missiles. This was in the early part of 96, prior to an election. And there were missiles that the tensions were raising. And President Clinton, the USS Independence, was the four deployed aircraft carrier at the time that was in Japan. And what uh, President Clinton and his administration did is they brought USS Nimitz in a modification of a deployment from the Middle East back and had two carrier battle groups, as they were called then. And this was the beginning, the first time that I think the PRC military looked and said, we don't really have a capability. They were, uh, they were not able to really respond to the military buildup that the, the Clinton administration had brought in. So there were two things that were happening in the 90s. Earlier, I think that the PRC military looked at uh, the way that the Desert Storm campaign was conducted, <coughs> very rapid and efficient. Um, a conflict in terms of just the tactical portion of it. And then later in 96, uh, when they were incapable of really doing much about the fact that there were uh, two carrier battle groups that were, that were generated and operating right off their coast. And that, I believe, began the, the evolution and the journey in the thinking in, in the PRC military of, okay, we've got to be able to do something about that. And you, of course, the DF-21 and the, the incredible growth uh, of the, the PRC uh, military's capability, in particular with their Navy, um, building a lot of ships and creating a capability now that can uh, influence their, the region with their power projection capability as well. So it's, uh, it's I think Seth summed up the, uh, the situation well, where the international rule set is advantageous to them, they'll comply with that. And where it's not, they don't. Uh, we have been, there's a concept that's known as freedom of navigation. And freedom of navigation is basically the principle that um, we do not accept a given nation's claims. 
So we will conduct, we the U.S. since the early 80s have conducted freedom of navigation uh, maneuvers in places where we don't accept uh, particular claims. The Obama administration did this. Uh, the Trump administration had suspended them for a portion, and then in 2017, in the mid part of the year, uh, resumed them. I think we've had one this year as well. We had four last. Um, and basically, it's a contesting of uh, excessive claims. On the other hand, there's innocent passage. And innocent passage is a concept that says you can pass through the territorial waters of another state and you accept or you agree um, or you comply with the, the coastal country's territorial uh, claim. So those are the kind of the distinctions between uh, the freedom of navigation exercises that you hear and, and innocent passage. And so with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap this up just to, to stay on task. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Fife. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> Good morning. We've heard about the the recent flights that the Chinese have taken over the Taiwan Strait. And there's also the aggressive island uh, expansions, the reclamations, and the conversion of uh, some of these disputed islands in the East and South China Sea. <clears throat> and the flights around Taiwan. And they all create a picture, a key element of which is, is China's squeezing Taiwan, which is a violation of the spirit of the one China policy that both the United States and China have pledged to uphold. We generally hear about the one China policy from Chinese, but it's not just the United States that has obligations under that policy. China does also. And the coercion, those coercive measures violate China's obligations. I think it's important to remind people of basics. Um, I'll make a broader point here. There's a <clears throat> When, when we have alliances and partnerships in the world, people who are experts in the field often take them for granted because the basic formulas are so well known to the people in the field. But what's remarkable, especially when you get to be a certain age, is you, you look back and you see that the things that are absolutely uh, rudimentary in the view of some older people are brand new for the younger people. And if we don't regularly and often reaffirm some of these basic points about why we have these relationships, why we have alliances, then the reliances can become unreliable. And so it really is incumbent on people who value these relationships, these longstanding relationships, to remind uh, over and over again the, the publics in both of the countries that, uh, that there really are solid grounds for, for the, the important relationships that have developed over decades. So in the case of Taiwan, it's important, I think, for Americans to understand that Taiwan is an open society. It's a democracy. It's a country of 23 million people. It's not a dot on the map. It's a country that 
I don't know exactly where it would stand, but if it were a European country, given that population, it would be, I think, in the middle of the pack. I mean, it would not be one of the smaller countries in Europe. Uh, it is also, and this is, I think, a rather astonishing statistic. For, it's America's more or less 10th trading partner in the world. I mean, maybe it's nine, maybe it's 11. I don't remember. I don't know precisely what it is at the moment, but it's around number 10. When you think about how many, you know, 200 countries in the world and Taiwan is our 10th trading partner, that's quite something. We have long-standing ties with Taiwan. We are committed to Taiwan's defense. And strategically, because of this long commitment, which, as Admiral Fox highlighted, goes well back uh, into the into the Eisenhower and uh, and Truman years, because of that long-standing relationship, our support for Taiwan's rights is seen around the world as a sign, as a measure of American credibility as a partner and ally. So it is no small thing that the United States maintain. And, and properly respect the relationship that we have and our, and our uh, duties toward Taiwan and upholding its defense. It's also, I think, important to point out that in addition to this other kind of squeezing that I referred to before, ta Taiwan is under constant cyber attack from China. And so are we. And this is an important area where, because of the advanced state of the Taiwanese economy, it's an important area where the United States and Taiwan can cooperate uh, for mutual benefit. Now, as important as it is that the United States do what it should do to uphold this relationship and maintain uh, our defense, our defenses in the region, it's important that Taiwan does what it's supposed to do. And it seems to, I think, many of the, of the experts who are um, you know, focusing on the way the Taiwanese are allocating their resources and, and dealing with defense that the Taiwanese government is not doing everything it should be doing in, uh, in the defense field. It's not spending what it should be spending. And I think it's, you know, we, we I made a, a, a pitch about the importance of the United States upholding the relationship. Well, the Taiwan government needs to uphold the relationship also by making sure that it's, it's carrying an appropriate amount of weight in the defense relationship and putting itself in a position where it can contribute to its own defense and contribute to our common defense interests. Now, China's unilateral actions to change the legal status of the, of the islands and the waters in the east and South China seas is a threat not only to the countries immediately involved. And I think the point about these Chinese flights over the middle of the Taiwan Strait, the aggressive position that the Chinese have taken on, on the islands in the area, these are not just a Taiwan issue. These go much beyond that. They're a threat not only to Taiwan, they're not only, and they're not a threat only to the countries immediately involved other than Taiwan, like Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. They're a threat to the idea of an orderly state system that operates according to agreed rules. <clears throat> China has been acting as if the established rules do not apply to it. Now, I'm aware that 
the United States often gets accused of uh, thinking that rules don't apply to it. I hear that when I speak at universities, any time one talks about other countries not obeying the rules, inevitably somebody will say, well, you know, the United States thinks it's exceptional, and they think that American exceptionalism means that the United States doesn't subject itself to international rules that it wants to apply to others. <clears throat> I don't think that's basically correct. I think the, that U.S. officials uphold the basic rules of the state system. The U.S. officials are accustomed to living in a society with a rule of law, and so they have no problem adhering to international rules also. And I think we generally do so. Top Chinese officials, however, preside over an unfree society. They operate above the law. The law for them is a tool of power, not a constraint on the people in power. It's not a constraint on the Communist Party, and it's not a constraint on its most senior political officials and not constrained by their own domestic law, senior Chinese officials show disregard for that weaker species of obligation known as international law. And I've heard Chinese scholars discuss the multiple sources of disdain for international rules on the part of Chinese leaders. One source, as I mentioned, is communist ideology, which puts the party above the law. But there are also sources rooted in powerful elements of Chinese strategic culture. These elements encourage chauvinistic views that China should dominate rather than operate as a nation among nations that deserve equal respect for their sovereignty. Where are we with the Trump administration? Well, the Trump administration has kept up a minimum level of engagement with Taiwan. We heard Admiral Fox make reference to the suspension and then initiation of some freedom of navigation uh, operations. The Trump policy is, I would, it, it looks like is just emerging now. So it's early, even though the administration has been around for, for a year. It's, um, uh, there have been long delays in getting uh, key positions filled. And so I, th I think we're at rather early in the administration uh, when it comes to seeing where their policy is going to go. A key element of it, of course, is, is the U.S. defense budget. And... Um, an important point to make about this is people often talk about our commitment to a given area of the world with reference to the specific military resources that we have in that area of the world. And I don't think that's a very good way to look at it. The United States has one armed force for the whole world. And so whether we happen to have a certain number of people deployed here or there is interesting, but it's not necessarily the main point. The main point is what are the total capabilities that we have that we could bring to bear if we needed to, because obviously our assets can be moved around. And so the, the big picture look at the US defense budget is crucial to understanding whether we're really serious about maintaining our commitments anywhere in the world, in, the, in East Asia or elsewhere. And the US defense budget is going up. It's not going up as much as many people believe it needs to if the United States is going to fulfill all of its various obligations uh, to its own interest and to its alliances and partnerships. Um, as 
as I heard at home this morning when I put this tie on, uh, this tie may have more ships on it than the U.S. Navy, and, and that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> cyber subversion, economic coercion, territorial bullying, subversive political influence are all challenges that China is posing to the United States, to Taiwan, and to the whole region. And in all of those areas, Taiwan has been a testing ground and a front line. And that should help us understand why this connection that we have with Taiwan is important. But as I said, we should keep in mind that these challenges go far beyond Taiwan and affect the whole question of whether we can have an orderly state system. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> well, we've heard three excellent presentations. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's turn the mic over to the floor, and if there are questions, we will recognize people from the floor. So, Abe. Hi, uh, Abe Shulsky. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson. Um, in the South China Sea, the, the Chinese have made this claim of sort of a territorial sea that has really no basis. I mean, it do, it's just inconsistent with the whole approach of the law of the sea. And they, they, their, hope, their famous nine-dash line sort of suggests that the sea itself is their territory, as opposed to having rights in the sea because they control the nearby land. And I was wondering, is that essentially what they're doing now in the Taiwan Straits? Is that the idea? They're trying to say that the Taiwan Strait is a territorial water, just like they've said the South China Sea is? I mean, or are, is, it, is it more subtle than that? Or have they not been clear, but just been sort of uh, poking around? They, they just claim all of Taiwan. So it's, it's even more basic than that. Well, but, but even if they. Well, but that would be another question. I mean, suppose they did have Taiwan. The Taiwan Strait is certainly Taiwan wide enough that we would regard that still as international water and have a right to, you know, we could still do freedom of navigation exercises through the Taiwan Strait, even if Taiwan were part of China, couldn't we? I mean, it's a big enough, it's a big enough area. But, but I think, I'm just wondering, are they make, is, is this kind of, similar to the South China Sea issue, where they're trying to make a claim in a very inchoate way that they not only have rights over the sea that's near their land, but they somehow have territory on the high seas that is just, that is just I mean, as if we said, well, the Gulf of Mexico is like Lake Ontario, I mean, or Lake Michigan, I suppose, because we don't want to share it with Canada. I mean, if we just said the Gulf of Mexico is our territory, that would be sort of similar to what uh, that they're doing in the South China Sea. So perhaps it's more analogous then to the Aedas um, in East China Sea, um, and in terms of sort of like the, like you said, claiming um, sort of the sovereign ability to determine who gets to go there. Um, while well, they haven't enforced it, but that was what they've what they've said. So um, I think perhaps when we were talking about the South China Sea, then then maybe we should view it. Um, from that perspective, that yeah, they 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 view it as being sensitive, even if uh, even if. Um, for example, the actions that the United States has taken are um, doing these fawn ops or uh, even getting close to some of their uh, their created things. They're they're, they're claiming that it's uh, that they have sort of ex additional rights. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say it's it's an interesting point that um, one of my colleagues made that about the Law of the Sea Treaty that the Chinese should, as a party to the Law of the Sea Treaty, work out the question of the status of these waters through the treaty. Now, I personally am skeptical about important elements of the treaty. I mean, the treaty is a, has some very sensible and appealing aspects, and it has, in my view, some deeply troubling aspects. 
and the United States is not a party, and I think there, there are some good reasons for that. Um, it's a matter of debate among, uh, intense debate, even among, I think, very sensible people in the United States. But, um, but the fact is the Chinese are a member, a party to the treaty, and, and they are not doing what parties to the treaty are supposed to do on precisely the questions, Abe, that you've raised. Uh, I mean, whether waters are inland waters for all practical purposes or international waters is an enormously significant question. It's precisely what the Law of the Sea Treaty is supposed to, right. to deal with. And if there are serious questions raised, they're supposed to be resolved through the mechanisms of the treaty. And I would simply point out to the people who advocate in favor of the treaty and think that it's really a valuable thing, uh, more valuable as a net matter than I think it is, I would say, you know, if you want to defend the treaty, then you should be pressing to see that it works, to see that the Chinese, having become a party, are using the mechanisms of the treaty to, to resolve these questions of what constitutes international waters or not. And if it doesn't, it really cheapens the whole treaty. <clears throat> yeah, another point, Abe, is that <clears throat> if you go simply by the treaty itself, the contiguous zone and the sovereign zone um, of Taiwan and China extend 24 miles out over a 100 mile area, which leaves 52 miles in the middle. And so I think it's that based on, for example, the Chinese actions in the Fiery Cross Islands in the Spratleys, which are hundreds of miles beyond the exclusive economic zone, that it's pretty safe to assume that they would claim that that little 52-mile band is, is theirs. We have other questions. Please. Um, Tina Chong with Voice of America. Well, I'll wait for the microphone. Hi. Tina Chong with Voice of America's China branch. Uh, my question is addressed to uh, Admiral uh, Fox. Um, so follow up with uh, the previous question on the Taiwan Strait. You think uh, U.S. should declare it as a, you know, claim or declare uh, Taiwan Strait as international waters and uh, operate uh, found up uh, operations uh, in the Taiwan Strait. And also we heard that uh, this area of the sea is very rough, so it's not uh, – I, I'd like to know your experience in that area. Is it uh, um, China's uh, capability, uh, um, A2AD, is it uh, developed far enough to prevent the U.S. from intervening, uh, you know, in the case of, um, you know, an attack or invasion or blockade to Taiwan? Thank you. Well, the, the Taiwan Strait is 100 miles-ish. So by definition, by international law, there's international water and airspace between Taiwan and mainland China. Uh, so there's no declaration on the part of the United States. Uh, it's an interesting uh, contradiction here because China has signed the Law of the Sea Treaty but doesn't observe it. The United States observes the Law of the Sea Treaty, but we haven't signed it. So there's that interesting uh, contradiction there. but. Um, so the U.S. and the U.S. Navy observe the Law of the Sea Treaty, uh, even though we're not sig uh, signatories to it. Uh, the question about the A2AD, uh, that's a, this is called uh, Preparation for Contingencies in Warfare, and it goes back a long, long time. It's not a new concept of wanting to either deny an adversary uh, access to a particular battle space or a region. And so the people who prepare for potential conflict take that into account. And what you do is you never lead with your jaw. You always find a way to accomplish your mission, and you go after your uh, opponent's weaknesses and, and protect your own. So the, um, the quote A2AD, it, 
I always look at these uh, as a as a professional military, as a retired professional military. I <laughs> don't do that anymore, but uh, I always look at these lines on the water. Of, uh, some people go, oh, this is the line of death. If you go inside this, you can't operate. Um, it's not so. And so you figure out how to do it, uh, and you obviously are thoughtful, and uh, you think a lot of different ways to uh, create maneuver room and operational uh, capability that give you the opportunity to do to accomplish your mission. Question up in the front row. Uh, good morning, uh, Neil Hare with Global Vision Communications. This is a question for the the entire panel. C can we expand a little bit more on the Trump policy towards Taiwan? You know, it seems within the, the last year, he's He's not beholden to these a lot of old constructs, many of which have harkened back to the end of World War II, um, and is willing to make changes, some very abruptly, like the moving Jerusalem you know, as the capital of Israel. Um, so are we going to see changes to our policy here, do you think? Um, and I guess related is, you know, how set in stone do you believe our, you know, our pledge to defend Taiwan is? Uh, if something were to happen militarily in the region. Thank you. you want to? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, speculating about what the Trump administration is going to do, um, I'd like to leave to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> um, my guess is that... Uh, um, it's um, as Doug pointed out. It's an evolving. You know, the answer isn't there yet. Um, it's taken a while to get the key policy people in place, both at state and the Defense Department. Um, when they are in place, uh, I think we'll have a a better ability to answer your question. Uh, but until then, uh, um, it looks to me as though the administration's uh, primary concern in East Asia is North Korea, um, and that's where the tweets are directed, and that's where the public statements go, and that's not only from the president, but from uh, secretaries of state and defense. So uh, aside from arms sales, um, which the administration got off to a good start on. Um, I think it's, as the popular and overused phrase goes, a work in progress. I guess the one, the one thing that I'd say is that Mr. Trump, as a candidate, made a number of, of pretty strong and harsh statements about um, America's allies and partners and criticized them generally as free riders and made people in the United States and around the world question whether he was committed to these longstanding alliance and partnership arrangements, or whether he was going to upend uh, all of them in Asia, NATO, and around the world. And that created a lot of agitation. Since he's become president, the thrust of his remarks, he's made, he's made a number of remarks, not all of which you know, hit the same theme. He's made a number of remarks, but the thrust of his remarks has been to reaffirm these longstanding relationships and to uphold alliances and partnerships. Um, and so, I mean, that's, I think that's significant. The, uh, that doesn't contradict the points that, that we've made that, you know, it's, it's, it's early. But, uh, and you know, things could go in any one of a number of directions in different areas. But I think in, in general, 
it is interesting to note that he has not, as president, uh, been as radical on the question of uh, leaning on our allies and partners. I mean, he has continued to lean on them, and interestingly enough, they've responded. I mean, uh, you know, I try to be fair-minded about this. I mean, he they they have responded in general with increasing their their defense expenditures, as he said they should. So that's an interesting reaction, and he seems to have shaken things up. I mean, American presidents over the decades have complained. I mean, this argument that our allies and partners are free riding is not something that Mr. Trump invented. On the contrary, I mean, it's been a it's been an evergreen complaint of American officials going back decades. But the general view of our allies was that it wasn't serious and that no, there were not going to be any consequences for continued to be viewed as free riders. And so uh, when, when Mr. Trump said it, he managed to achieve credibility for himself as somebody who really would upset the apple cart if this problem were not mitigated. And there has been some mitigation with certain allies and partners increasing their spending, which is, which I guess is to the credit of, uh, of what he said. On the other hand, you have this, this question of, is he really undermining confidence in our word? And I think he's tended as president to try to increase confidence by, you know, downplaying some of the more radical statements he made about, uh, our alliances. So at the moment, it looks like we're basically on the path to reaffirming the importance of these alliances while he's trying to maintain pressure on, uh, on all of these various allies and partners to uh, increase their contribution to the common defense. Um, I just pulled out, as we were going through this, a summary of the national defense strategy that was just issued. and. Uh, I think General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, probably personally wrote this. I, I recognize his, his penmanship here. <laughs> Quote, China is a strategic competitor using predatory economics to intimidate its neighbors while militarizing features in the South China Sea. Um, lever China is leveraging military modernization, influence operations, predatory economics to coerce neighboring countries to reorder the Indo-Pacific region to their advantage. So when you go through this, it's very, uh, the national defense strategy, and even going back to the, the document that the executive branch put out in December, um, there is this, the tweet sphere, and then there are the uh, documents that actually hold together pretty well in terms of the way that we are going through our national strategic reviews and uh, posturing our uh, defense strategy of note and of encouragement, certainly. Um, at the very end of this thing, we're talking about alliances and partnerships and you know, strengthening alliances, attracting new partners, and ensuring that we maintain favorable regional balances of power uh, in Indo-Pacific. That's the term of art that, the, uh, that General Mattis is using. So, um, the military requirement to be prepared is, uh, is always present regardless of the administration. And so you think through, how are we going to deal with this? At the end of the day, the smart person does not want to go to war. At the same time, the best way to prevent conflict is to be prepared for it, and that is the clearest way to deter uh, horrible consequences, is to be prepared and that way prevent it. Give me a choice between parsing Trump's tweets and studying and trying to figure out what's going on inside Zhongnanhai. I'll always go with trying to figure out what's what's going on in Zhongnanhai. So, um, but I but I think it is I think so. But I think it is worthwhile examining um, as others have done, like the the appointments that that Trump has made to various um, important uh, security positions. Um, the sort of the prevalence of people like Matt Pottinger um, who are sort of more Asia focused. I mean that's that's clearly. Um, you know, a, a thing. Um, also, uh, I believe this week there's a few uh, important U.S. senators who are visiting Taiwan. So, I mean, to me, I don't get a whole lot out of the tweets. Um, but like, what kind of what are the meetings that are happening? 
those are the things that I would think of as like as a more important indicator um, because there's going to be a lot of back and forth. People change their minds. So in public statements, don't matter nearly as much to me. But um, like Mark said, the, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, those are two sort of things where you can hang your hat on, but also the, these, uh, these appointments. I think that will give us a lot longer term um, value in terms of figuring out what's going on. Um, Other questions, sir? Uh, Yoshi Komori of the Japanese newspaper, Sanke Shimbun. Yeah. Uh, as you know, the Chinese official armed vessels are coming into Japanese territorial water around the Senkak Islands in the East China Sea. And they, they come as often as uh, three times a month and cruise around in the Japanese territorial water for two hours and then leave. So, and that creates concern, naturally, on the part of Japanese that they might go further soon to actually land on the islands or the or just uh, occupy the whole thing. So could anyone address this Chinese move toward the Senkak Islands in the context of China's overall strategy or policy toward Taiwan, if there's any connection, direct linkage, or anything like that? I'll start and uh, pass it off to my colleagues. It's a pattern of activity that we've seen, and it continues. So. Uh, if you can ever reach the point where egregious behavior becomes accepted, then somehow it's become accepted and people become uh, numb to it. And so I think it's, uh, it's something that needs to be a source of concern and to be a source of focus. You need to, uh, we need to be able to understand uh, those kinds of activities. The actions are obviously driven by somebody making a decision to do that. And how do we now reach a point where we are able to influence from a, from a policy level to say, stop, stop doing that. That's, that's not, a, um, it's not an accident. It's not a coincidence when it happens in a repetitive fashion. One of the things I've watched um, has the, is the um, data that the Japanese Ministry of Defense has put out, um, especially since 2013, sort of as the, the number of intercepts um, that it's made with Chinese aircraft, um, and increasingly also of what well, we've increasingly seen sort of uh, periods where there's Chinese military aircraft in the area and also Chinese naval vessels in an area um, at the same time, sort of either transiting through international waters or getting near, um, like you said, the Senkakus. Um, and of course, recently we had the, I believe it was a Shang class uh, nuclear submarine surfacing or being forced to surface um, near, those, near, those, near those waters. And, and if, I think we should just sort of take it for granted that um, their diesel uh, submarines, such as the Kilo class ones based in Changshan, are just are going to be operating in those areas. Um, we know that they're going out to sea um, very frequently. Um, so I think, yeah, but I think we should sort of. Um, look at this broader um, pattern of, of activity. And I think it would also behoove um, a, Taiwan uh, used to actually publish uh, numbers about this, the, the number of aircraft that were being intercepted. Um, they made a decision um, to stop doing that. But there's three, I think, white papers that actually presented and had this data. And, and if you look at it, it's, it's quite, uh, quite astounding. I, 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 took the, I took that data and looked at the, the trends. And if it has continued on uh, on the sort of upward trajectory that it was um, on when they last published this information, then we'd see something around 2,000 flights, I think, um, to the to the to the center line in Taiwan per year. Of course, that that's sort of interpreting and sort of you know looking forward. Um, but I think I think it behoove Taiwan to sort of reconsider to, uh, issuing that kind of data again. Again, the fact that Japan has. Uh, decided to release this information. Uh, that's it's it's a baseline. Um, to my knowledge, uh, Vietnam, uh, of course, the Philippines. No, like these are uh, no other nation uh, puts out information like that. Uh, but I think if we want to kind of see how China is ratcheting up um, its uh, its its flight its military flights, or like you said, even um, militarized ships like Coast Guard vessels. Um, and to channel Andrew Erickson here, uh, the sort of maritime militia, I think, is something that, I mean, the, 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 we, we know from these uh, open, uh, sort of the, the uh, uh, 
the, the, the sensors aboard the, these ships, that there are a lot of actual fishing vessels that are going in, 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 in near, uh, near the Senkakus and near other sort of territorial claims. And a lot of these are actually associated with um, actual official Chinese mar maritime militia. Um, we actually, in the, in the People's Daily recently, there was a, um, an article from a, a former president of the Academy of Military Sciences um, in, in Beijing that was talking about how the maritime militia and other scientific vessels, all of these sort of, all of these vessels, not, not just uh, Coast Guard, maritime militia, scientific vessels, and Navy, all of them together are an important part of turning the PRC into a uh, strong maritime nation. So we, we, we can't just sort of look, I mean, they, they don't view these things as being separate. They view them as, as being part of a larger whole. So it behooves us not just to look at, like you, like you said, sort of the, the, mil, the, the more overt, uh, you know, gray holes. We also have to look at the white holes and the, <laughs> and, and the fishing vessels as well, so. And also to address your question and the question that preceded, although it's, uh, not possible to tell what this actually means. I believe the president has already said that the Senkaku Islands are Japanese. So determining what the consequence of that is, we'll wait to see, but that's a positive statement. We have another question, sir. Retired Foreign Service Officer. I'm wondering if uh, members of the panel could address the uh, sort of history of port call by the U.S. Navy on Taiwan, uh, uh, particularly in the light of some uh, uh, Chinese officials' uh, remarks about there being kind of a marker put down there to mark the relationship. You know, I don't at my fingertips have the last time that there was a U.S. Navy port call in Taiwan. I'm, I'm witting to and aware of the, the expressed concern on the part of the, the Chinese administration, if you will, that that's a, that's a third rail. Of course, the evolution from the Truman Eisenhower era and then, you know, the, the watershed event was obviously when Kissinger and, and Nixon uh, went to China in the early 70s. And I think that um, there has been this hope and assumption that by engaging uh, China over the last 35-ish or however many years, that we're drawing them back into this uh, business of being a responsible member in the international community. And I think, this is a personal opinion, now you see their activities of uh, being very aggressive and actually changing topography and building islands and that sort of thing, uh, I think it's probably time to consider that they are not interested in necessarily being a, a productive member of the international community. They have their own uh, worldview. And so um, as I was doing some of the research in preparation for this, though, the uh, we put F-86s with brand new Sidewinders into Taiwan in 1958, and the Sidewinders worked really well the first time. Um, so there's been an evolution, obviously, the, uh, the defense uh, support to be able to provide the Taiwan uh, military the ability to defend themselves uh, is something that also, I think, is, is important for us to, uh, to consider so that there's not an ability to to coerce and to force in, in, a, in a negative outcome. I'll just add one, one small thing to that, um, is that there, there's sort of an assumption uh, whenever it comes to U.S. support calls there that, that, it's sort of, that essentially we just need to approve um, the U.S. Navy to go there and it can happen. Um, there are some other considerations, I just think that deserve to be mentioned, uh, like what is the Taiwanese side? Like, I think there are some actual concerns uh, among the Taiwanese side, whether they can actually support where they have the facilities to accommodate the US. And so that's another conversation we need to be having in parallel. Um, if this is something that needs to, ha that, that is going to happen longer term, well, there, there are some facilities and they need to be built. Um, a lot of the ports actually can't accommodate larger uh, US vessels. 
again, not necessarily a you know a, a barrier, an insurmountable barrier, but just some other things that kind of need to happen as in parallel to to efforts for that to go forward. And uh, again, we shouldn't just assume that this is a natural sort of turnkey. We can immediately uh, you know make the law, and it will happen next year. There, there's other things going on there. Well, truth be told, though, I, l let's be honest that port visits of naval vessels around the world, that's actually, it's a, it's a diplomatic initiative. It's a means of, and in fact, um, Secretary Mattis and his counterpart in Vietnam are going to have an aircraft carrier pull into Cameron Bay for the first time in a long, long time, I think. So there are some other ways, I think, to, to kind of transmit that. And um, so it, it's, a, it's a diplomatic uh, decision to do so. Question here, and then we'll go across the aisle. Uh, Eric Carnden, a uh, graduate student over at Georgetown's MSFS program. Uh, Admiral, there's a question regarding China's use of limited war techniques, techniques kind of to avoid strong retaliatory action against the United States. What can you can you discuss? What levels of deterrence the United States can use um, to counter those types of actions? Whether it's whether it's in the Taiwan Strait, whether it's in the South China Sea, um, what can the United States and the international community do to counter these kind of limited war? Uh, techniques utilized by the Chinese where a re strong retaliatory response might not be credible. Right. Uh, that's a great question, and it's something that I think uh, the 7th Fleet Commander and the, the PAC Fleet and the PACOM Commanders all uh, think about. In a broad sense, um, you want to prevent miscalculation and you want to prevent uh, escalation of tensions. And yet, on the one hand, uh, the PLAN and the Chinese activities have been escalatory. And so without getting into a ships bumping into each other, uh, there has to be a means by which uh, there are conversations between leaders that prevent those conditions from happening. That's the ideal situation. And I, you know, you can go back, we had the incidents at sea agreement with the Soviets back in the early 70s because we were in this place where we, the U.S. Navy, were having uh, literally, there were ships that were bumping into each other, and there was the there were these kind of escalatory, and a lot of a lot of opportunity for miscalculation. And we sat down with the Soviets in the early '70s. It was when uh, John Warner was Secretary of the Navy, and hammered out this incidents at sea uh, agreement. So I think there's one place where there should be uh, conversations to say, as People with gray hair and grandchildren, I, I don't want us to have a conflict with China. I really don't. At the same time, we must not be coerced or pushed. And so the rheostat and this ability to prevent them from um, accomplishing aggressive and provocative actions and not being uh, held accountable or not having to uh, modify that behavior it's, this is the essence of both statesmanship and seamanship, if you will. Um, there are a number, I, you, there are a wide spectrum of different things that you can do. Um, but our response, for example, of, hey, we do freedom of navigation because we don't recognize these claims. Um, and so we have, you know, you can go back, the, the EP3 incident of 2001. Uh, some of these aggressive uh, maneuvers in terms of airplanes uh, intercepting. Um, this is a place for the grown-ups and the adults to sit down and make sure that we create uh, a construct where we can operate in international waters and do our operations without uh, escalating in, into either miscalculation or into conflict. And <clears throat> I'd add one point when you talk about a the deterrence strategy. It's a, it's a noteworthy point that we now have in our defense strategy, as Admiral Fox had just read, a term that is new and really deserves attention, more attention than it's gotten, I think, in the general press. And that's the term Indo-Pacific. I mean, you know, it just kind of slips in, but it represents a serious new thought mm -hmm. in world affairs. Um, 
I mean, one of the most interesting points about strategy is how one's conception of security is related to maps. And, you know, the idea that, I mean, isolationism, for example, is certainly <clears throat> promoted by the fact that most Americans, when they look at a map, are looking at the United States, and there are these big blue patches on either side and nothing else. And then you've got you know, Canada and Mexico and, and blue. And that kind of gives you the impression that we're OK. And, but if depending on how you look at the world and what's the center of the map that you're looking at, you can have a completely different conception of what the strategic picture is. And now, just recently, I don't know, I mean, I haven't done the study on, on like who coined the term or when it first entered into the, uh, into the lexicon, but this term Indo-Pacific is really important because it's a strategic concept that, and I'm sure it, it relates partly to, to the rise of China, but it also relates partly to the recognition that the United States now has enormous strategic ties and potential strategic ties of great importance, not only to South Korea and Japan, but coming all the way around to India. And so our strategic conception is related to our relationships. And, and then, of course, you know, in the center of that, of that arc is China. And so it's a way of looking at the world that you didn't get much discussion of until quite recently. And it's a, it, it, you, you see it in the administration's uh, you know, national security strategy and national defense strategy documents. And it's worth noting, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a new way of thinking about the grandest strategic challenges that, that we're facing. Questions? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Gerion Wiese from the German Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Liberty. Um, I'd like to know from the uh, distinguished panel um, that I guess we have seen some kind of increase in the aggressiveness of Chinese geopolitics under President Xi. And now we have this um, very case here uh, that just happened recently. Um, how do you view the uh, military capabilities of Taiwan itself to be uh, actually to do something about it or to actually act independently from, for example, the United States, because I've read a book, and it's from 10 years ago, but it said um, it was a very uh, analysis of, of Taiwan's military capabilities, and it said that there would never be a conventional invasion of China to Taiwan because it would just be too costly, too, the cost would be too high because Taiwan's defense capabilities are actually too strong. And I was a bit doubtful about that, <laughs> and I thought maybe uh, the reason for the author's optimism was that he's married to a Taiwanese. So um, <laughs> I was a bit doubtful about that, So um, and it seemed too optimistic for me, uh, and I would like to know your opinion on that. Well, first of all, the, um, the distances involved, even though you go, well, it's only 100 miles wide, that's a long way to go in amphibious assault. Um, so it's not a simple problem. At the, here's, here's what I think is happening, and kind of back to the hybrid and the, uh, the gray uh, activities, cyber, infiltration, the, the, I think that the strategy really is to, to withdraw or to sap the will to either resist or to be able to defend um, with a kind of a, uh, a thoughtful campaign of dry rot, atrophy, we can't do this. Militarily, it's a difficult problem. It's hard. And Formosa, I, Taiwan, is a big island. And so 23 million people, uh, when, when we, the US, were contemplating invading Japan at the end of World War II, it was a really hard. Uh, and we'd, gotten, we'd had a lot of good practice in it in the years running up to it. So I think an amphibious. A mil the military aspects of an amphibious assault against the, uh, the, the island of Taiwan 
it's militarily uh, feasible, it's really hard, and I think it would be very costly. Then this gets into the risk-reward, how much is it worth? It's much better probably to work in a different way, a more indirect or, in, you know, and so I, I think we see a number of these things. You have to, if you don't have some credible military capability, then you, then your diplomats lose traction, you know, and so it, it works, they, they work together. You don't just do one or the other. There's a lot of discussion that you'll see and hear nowadays about our fleet is not big enough, we need to build more ships. Uh, there's been a kind of a, a, an era in which we've allowed the, you know, the U.S. Navy has reached a point where it doesn't have enough ships and the maintenance hasn't been done and we've had uh, tragic uh, incidents in the Western Pacific. And so there's a new sharp focus on the fact that you need credible military capability to be able to influence uh, events around the world. So you see that kind of talk in the Renaissance within the Department of the Navy and Department of Defense. Um, but back to the question of how hard a nut is Taiwan to crack for an amphibious assault. Um, it, it's hard, it's militarily feasible, but it would be a costly effort, in my opinion. The China Group, we've been tracking the Chinese military modernization um, that started at the end of 2015 pretty closely. So um, it, it's a, a few things are, are worth kind of highlighting. Um, first of all is the sort of PLA's self-assessments. Um, people like Dennis Blasco have written about this really extensively, that essentially the, the PLA doesn't regard itself as, as, being cap as being there yet. I mean, they have set these goals for themselves. Um, originally, it was, uh, it was 2020 uh, and then 2049. The latter uh, one of these have actually moved up uh, to 2035. So they're trying to accelerate this. But they're trying to do an, an enormous number of things in a very compressed period of time. And it's, and it's been incredibly chaotic. Um, you had sort of the, you had sort of, there's sort of two phases, the, the bo zi sha, the bo zi shang, above the neck and below the neck. So they've, of course, they reorganized all their major uh, units. They've got the theater commands that have come out. Um, but this has been, on the individual level, this has been just really chaotic. There's, no one really knows who, which offices report to which ones. Um, the, the training is all out of whack. You have, uh, that's sort of at the officer level, you have people who are in charge of like a regiment and then all of a sudden they're in charge of a brigade. You know, and just massive changes in, in levels of responsibility and that's gonna take them a while to to, to adapt to and, and they're actually very, um, they're, they're pretty blunt about it in, in the official press actually, um, that this is something that they have to overcome. Um, they're also striving to achieve the sort of the networked type uh, warfare that we have, where you have sensors and everything like that, you can, you know, everyone can talk to each other. Um, they're also not there yet. They, they, they've, they have, they'll have uh, military exercises where service air missile batteries, you know, don't can't tell the good guys and the bad guys apart. So, while it's really tempting to uh, to kind of to look at the modernization that PLA has had and kind of think, oh wow, they've made all this progress, and they have, especially since two thousand, like a two thousand four PLA uh, or afterward two thousand four and before. Two different things, um, but that they simply aren't there yet. They don't think they're there yet. And then, kind of like to kind of build off what Mark was saying, you know, they don't have the amphibious lift capacity. Um, and if they started to build it, um, then it'd be very it'd be very obvious. So Taiwan would have a lot of um, sort of time to prepare. Um, but but it is it is worth noting that uh, you know this is a country that I think you know in the in the early two thousands was planning on building lots of small little. Uh, fast boats with anti-ship cruise missiles and things like that. And now they're building, I think, four of the largest cruisers simultaneously. So enormous industrial capacity certainly could get there, isn't clearly making smart investments in what it thinks it needs to achieve that mission in terms of the uh, PLA rocket force, things like that, um, but also just sort of not there yet. And it's also worth noting what the, the Taiwanese are doing. Uh, the, the Taiwanese uh, defense white papers are all worth... Um, <coughs> Uh, reading and looking into, they're, they're making smart investments on you know how to adapt to the, these changing threats. So, and it also ought to be pointed out that Taiwan's navy is a solid and professional one. They're good sailors, good officers. Um, their Taiwan is, as you may know, in the process of designing and building an indigenous indigenous submarine, building their own submarine. Um, when they succeed in accomplishing that, that will improve their defenses substantially 
uh, against an amphibious assault. I mean, there's all kinds of other things that can be done with a submarine, but um, that's one of the things that would apply specifically in this case um, that deserves our, the United States' support. Other questions? Well, uh, we're uh, right on target. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning in a useful and interesting discussion. Uh, your questions have been excellent, and thank you, panel, for your wonderful answers. Um, and, uh, this will not be uh, our last discussion of this issue. Uh, I hope you'll stay tuned and join us for the next one. Thank you.